Yeah, let's say that the UFO craft that you're talking about are real and that the effects and the speeds and the stuff that you're talking about are real. What are we dealing with here? Like, what? how are these things doing what they're doing in your opinion? Yeah, so I, I have no idea. This is all speculation, but it would probably some be some sort of like cold fusion, like low energy nuclear reaction or something where, you know, like hot fusion is, you know, controllable fusion is the holy grail in, um, you know, energy unlocks. So, uh, you know, we're now experimenting with magnetic confinement of lasers to, you know, allow for fusion. It's really high energy fusion. And it, in my opinion, it kind of defeats the the purpose a little bit because the amount of energy, you know, you have to input to like make the thing work and amount of technical prowess, it's just extremely complicated. Mm. Um, so it's again, this sort of horseshoe thing. That it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you need some like fundamental unlock. There um, were a couple of scientists that thought they did it, P Pons and Fleischmann. And I, do, I don't know if they did. I'm not deep down that conspiracy. So I don't know if we have cold fusion. Like, I don't know if, I don't know if, you know, uh, uh, we have like alien reproduction vehicles where we have UFOs that we have in saucers that like America can fly. I, mm. I don't know of that at all. So as far as how the aliens are flying them, I don't know, but like it would probably be some sort of cold fusion on the front end energy wise and then some sort of magnetic sensing. So um, robins, you know, birds actually uh, navigate home using the magnetic field of the earth. Um, so they have this avian cryptochromes, these CRY4 proteins uh, uh, that basically using uh, 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 electron spin can understand where the magnetosphere of the earth is and th that's how they know where they are spatially and it's more accurate than you know optical and it allows them to navigate home and quantum biology is this sort of burgeoning field generally like um photosynthesis enzyme creation a lot of things are now being tr attributed to quantum mechanical effects inside the body the body's notoriously warm wet and noisy and um you know, uh, uh, create sort of decoherence when it comes to quantum. So we didn't think that anything quantum occurred, but now more and more evidence is pointing towards sort of quantum stuff happening. Mm. And a lot of the crafts, when people see them, like Commander David Fravor and others, you know, he's the guy in 2004 off the coast of San Diego, the Nimitz group, um, seem to think that the crafts feel like they're almost like alive, like they're almost like biological organisms or beings themselves or something. And my guess is they would probably use some sort of quantum sensing for the navigation because uh, it's more accurate. Even even Lockheed has something called the dark ice magnetometer, which uses quantum sensing. And it is more accurate than, for example, GPS. Like if you lose GPS comms and you're in some sub like, you know, deep underwater or whatever, you would use this like dark ice magnetometer. So that's such that, a sick name. It's it's epic. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think that for the the navigation and then for the propulsion, I would use something called the Byfield Brown effect, <laughs> which is basically, so there's this guy Town, Townsend Brown, and um, he started, he was this uh, mid-century guy, he was born in 1905, and in the 20s, he started to experiment with these uh, Coolidge X-ray tubes and noticed that when he ran current through them, they would jump. And now every X-ray tube has an anode and a cathode, so a negative electrode and a positive electrode. And he was basically, in his mind, he's like, I think that there is some sort of attractant force where the negative electrode is moving towards the positive electrode. And this goes beyond sort of traditional electrostatics, and it might sort of experimentally unify the field of physics. Like backing up for a second, this is a real, it's a really big deal. Like, like <laughs> SpaceX, you know, if you were to go with the Falcon 9, their state of the art, um, you know, uh, uh, rocket. Um, you know, now they're experimenting with Starship, but, you know, if you were to take Falcon 9 to uh, Proxima Centauri B, the closest habitable planet, um, you know, outside of, outside of Earth, it would take you like 80 to 100,000 years. And if you were to try to update that with nuclear thermal propulsion, which SpaceX isn't even, for whatever reason, investigating, maybe you could cut that in half, like 30 or 40,000 years. So it's just like, it doesn't work. Like you, for, as far the his whole interstellar thing is, it's kind of like, it's a great like recruiting tool. Like that's awesome. Go to the moon first. Maybe you can get to Mars if you're really lucky. Awesome. But like Starship burns nine tenths of its fuel tank, just getting to low earth orbit. That So it's like, that's how far away we are with chemical combustion and Newton's three laws. So if you could come up with some sort of propulsion that married electromagnetism and gravity, if, if electromagnetism were the input 
and gravity were the output, that would be a massive deal. We have four forces in physics, electromagnetism, gravity, the weak force, and the strong force. Weak force and strong force you can forget because they're not long range. You can't do anything with them. Uh, electromagnetism is the only thing that you can do anything with really in a lab. Uh, and that took actually originally a, a Faraday in the early 19th century, who was a, a bookbinder from a very poor family in South London, uh, coming up with this idea that, you know, magnetic fields could actually interact with light. And then it was James Clerk Maxwell and, you know, eventually, you know, Heinrich Hertz and then Tesla and Edison sort of perfected that. But it was this long sort of, you know, chain of like figuring this out. Um, and and since then, we've had, you know, the standard model, which basically governs, you know, particle physics and quantum mechanics. And then you have Einstein's theory of gravity and gravity is over here on an island. And then you have quantum mechanics and that's over here and it's, they're just not reconcilable. And so if you could reconcile them, mm -hmm. that would be a massive deal. And nobody, uh, nobody would like Neil deGrasse Tyson would admit <laughs> that that would be a massive deal if you could reconcile them. And there are people trying to reconcile them theoretically. You've had Eric Weinstein on your show. He you know, and he's talked about the restricted data and the Atomic Energy Commission, 1954. I remember actually it was a really funny part of the interview. He goes, Chris, do you know about restricted data? And you're like, I don't know. What, like, it's the most obscure. Like, <laughs> but, um, you know, he's trying to do that, right? Theoretically. Um, I believe that this guy Townsend Brown did this experimentally. And now an FBI document has been FOIA'd, used the you know, Freedom of Information Act to come out. Um, that in 1942, it said he was the, the lead radar scientist in the entire Navy. So by the way, the context here is people who've been trying to discredit him say that he's a total quack and has like no bona fides whatsoever. So now we're realizing he's the top radar guy, you know, in the night in the Navy, his stuff is definitely classified by the Navy. There's this whole saga of his daughter trying to declassify his stuff from the Navy. And they say that the, the, the secretary for the Navy on the phone says, you know, if, uh, if some of this stuff were classified, we couldn't let it out. Like just FY hypothetically. Right. Mm. And then they give her a very slimmed down little dossier on Townsend Brown. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think he, uh, did, I think he discovered a, a, a whole lot. Um, and, uh, that's now been vindicated that the, his radar prowess, the fact that his work made it into the B2 stealth bomber, I think has now been figured out. Uh, so there's this other part of his work called electrohydrodynamics, the use of electric fields uh, to manipulate airflow. And I think we now know that that work made it into the B2 stealth bomber because the financier who was funding Townsend Brown is a guy named Floyd Odlum, who uh, was a large owner in Northrop at the time. And he had all these kind of covert meetings with Curtis LeMay, who's the secretary of the Air Force, and with the Rand Corporation. And then all of a sudden, uh, the B2 is using these big electric fields to manipulate airflow we i mean we know that that's like literally a fact you can look up right now that it uses electric fields to manipulate airflow and these were the experiments that floyd odlum this majority owner and and northrop was funding via townsend brown was electric fields and their you know manipulation of airflow and there's a paper in 1968 of northrop starting to look into this right after that funding took place so you have this guy who's supposed to be a total quack two out of the three things mm. are being vindicated now the electrohydrodynamics and the radar thing and then there's a third thing and the third thing is he's saying that he unified the field in physics and he's saying he did it experimentally in two places um at the Montgolfier facility in Paris in France, where you have a guy named Jacques Cornillon, who is a technical representative of Sud West, this, you know, aerospace company there. There's a recording of him making a deathbed confession saying the results were successful. It was tricky experimental conditions, but the results were successful. He's on his deathbed saying this. I, I have the recording. Um, and then in uh, 1957 at the Bonson lab, uh, there's a video of Townsend Brown. He's popping champagne. It's, you know, he says, you know, in his own, you know, uh, uh, accounting that this this experiment was successful. And Bonson was no scrub. Bonson at the time was convening all of the top theoretical physicists in the world to talk about gravity. So this is this whole Eric Weinstein kind of conspiracy that public physics was being sent down the wrong path while private physics remained incredibly vital. And I think it was surrounding this guy named Thomas Townsend Brown, who was doing this. He was this not super refined theoretician, but while he's doing his experiments in the back room, the guys in the front room are, you have Richard Feynman, you have 
uh, John Wheeler, you have Peter Bergman, you have Freeman Dyson, you have literally the top theoretical physicists being funded by the same guy who's funding Towns and Brown. And they're all there to discuss gravity. Mm. And guess who's uh, uh, funding the entire conference? Wright Airfield. And this is now called Wright-Patterson, which is the center of all UFO lore today. And it's where the, the materials were supposedly taken after Roswell, for example. We'll get back to talking in just a minute. But first, some things are built for summer. Sunburns, hot girl walks, your ex posting their Euro road trip, and now lemonade and salt. Huh? Element just dropped their brand new lemonade salt flavor, and it's everything that you want on a hot day. Tart, salty, and stupidly refreshing. It's like a grown-up lemonade stand in a stick with actual function behind the flavor. Because, let's be real, if you're sweating through workouts, sauna sessions, or just walking to your car in July, then you are losing more than just water. Element replaces the electrolytes that your body actually needs. Sodium, potassium, and magnesium with no sugar, no junk, and no nonsense. I've been drinking it every single day for years, and in the Texas heat, this lemonade flavor in a cold glass of water is unbelievably good. Best of all, they've got a no-questions-asked refund policy with an unlimited duration, so you can buy it and try it for as long as you want, and if you don't like it for any reason, they'll give you your money back, and you don't even need to return the box. That's how confident they are that you'll love it. Plus, they offer free shipping in the US. Right now, you can get a free sample pack of Element's most popular flavors with your first purchase by going to the link in the description below or heading to drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom. That's drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that clip, you will love the full-length episode available right here.